In May of 2010, the Department of Veterans Affairs announced the nationwide rollout of a nomenclature for self-directed violence. The following presentation is intended to help VA clinicians gain familiarity with the nomenclature and the associated clinical tool. These represent a collaboration between the VISN-19 MIRIC and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Before we get started, we want to clarify that the purpose of the nomenclature is to help clinicians identify correct terms when they're working with or discussing patients who are experiencing thoughts of self-directed violence or have engaged in self-directed violent behaviors. In its present form, the nomenclature is not by itself a suicide risk assessment tool. However, it's the hope that by accurately identifying certain characteristics of self-directed violence, that we will help clinicians make well-informed decisions about the extent to which a person is at greater risk for suicide. We want to help you acquire and proficiently use a new nomenclature for self-directed violence. Over the course of this talk, we're going to think and talk about how clinicians, researchers, and even the general public talk about suicidal and non-suicidal forms of self-directed violence. In talking about the language we use, we'll demonstrate that in the past there's not been uniformity about how we talk about these issues. Some of our language is confusing, some of it's pejorative, and there are clinical, empirical, and even social consequences of the language we use. Before teaching the nomenclature, I'd like you to take a pretest to illustrate the difficulty of accurately describing self-directed violent thoughts and behaviors, particularly when we, when we all talk about suicide and self-harm differently. Following the pretest, we're going to discuss the new self-directed violence nomenclature, which encompasses the range of both suicidal and non-suicidal self-directed violent thoughts and behaviors. After we've reviewed the concepts in some detail and worked through a few vignettes together, I'll ask you to complete a post-test so you can assess your ability to utilize the system in your clinical work. Let's start with a case example. A healthy 21-year-old female is brought by her boyfriend to the emergency department after telling him she's ingested 4 to 6 regular strength Tylenol. She reports no ill effects. During triage, she states that before she took the capsules, she was upset and wished she was dead. She feels better now and requests to go home. I'd like you to take a moment and write down what terms you would use to describe this behavior. Oftentimes, individuals, clinicians, and researchers come up with a wide range of terms to describe this particular scenario. This list highlights how difficult it is to accurately and reliably talk about and understand suicide and related behaviors and communications. Do you notice any terms that might be considered pejorative? Are there any that are not, you're not familiar with? And are there some that seem synonymous with others? The clinical implications of the problem are clear. If clinicians mean different things when they're using the same term, communication becomes problematic. It's important that clinicians are able to uniformly describe and communicate a concept, be it in writing or via verbal communication. The implications for research and public health are notable. In research, the way an investigator defines or operationalizes a term has great bearing on the generalizability of the results. With regards to public health, organizations like the CDC are concerned with epidemiological trends. Thus, it's extremely important that there are accurate definitions of similar behaviors such as suicide attempts and other non-suicidal self-directed violence behaviors. Let's start with what a nomenclature is. A nomenclature is a set of commonly understood, widely acceptable, comprehensive terms that define a basic clinical phenomenon. And they're also, the terms are based on a logical set of necessary component elements that can be easily applied. Essential features of a nomenclature are that it enhances clarity of communication, it has applicability across clinical settings, it can be theory neutral, and should be culturally neutral, and that terms are mutually exclusive and encompass a spectrum of thoughts and actions. Whereas a nomenclature is a taxonomy of terms and definitions related to a particular topic, a classification system is a more exhaustive categorization and breakdown of subtypes of related phenomena. In relation to suicide, a classification system would be used to help organize subtypes of behaviors. For example, via use of the modifiers that help to differentiate one behavior from another. We'll now introduce you to the VISN-19 MIREC CDC Self-Directed Violence Classification System. Please access your first handout, which is, in the, which is the classification system. As we transition into reviewing the actual materials, we want to reiterate that in its present form, the nomenclature is not a suicide risk assessment tool. The hope would be that we could eventually build upon the nomenclature to better assess risk, but we're not at that point yet. 
The first order of business is to make sure that we're all describing self-directed violence in a way that is understandable and consistent. The red section on this slide represents the nomenclature, and the blue section is the classification system. There are two types of self-directed violence, thoughts and behaviors. When reviewing vignettes, there are times that both thoughts and behaviors are present. In such cases, behaviors should trump thoughts for purposes of classification. On this next slide, you'll see that there are six subtypes of thoughts and behaviors. When both are present, self-directed violent behaviors trump preparatory behaviors for the purpose of classification. Next, you'll see again the definitions of the subtypes, the modifiers, and the 22 terms. Next, I'd like you to pull out the Self-Directed Violence Classification System Clinical Tool. You can see on the front side there's some decision-making questions followed by three decision trees, and then on the back side are some key terms and a reminder regarding behaviors trumping thoughts. On the next slide, you'll see that we've provided a case example. Um, in this case example, it says you're working with a depressed client. You ask if she has thought of killing herself, and she says, well, sometimes the thought pops into my head, but I would never do it because of my kids. Now, I want you to look at the clinical tool in front of you and start with the three questions. The first question is, is there any indication that the person engaged in self-directed violent behavior, either preparatory or potentially harmful? What's the answer to that question for this vignette? It's no in this case, so you proceed to question two. Is there any indication that the person had self-directed violent related thoughts? In this case, the answer is yes, so you would proceed to decision tree A. Next, you would ask yourself, were or are the thoughts suicidal? In this case, the answer is yes. And then you ask yourself, if the thoughts are suicidal, is there evidence of suicidal intent? Let's review the key concept of suicidal intent. The definition is there's past or present evidence, explicit or implicit, that an individual wishes to die, means to kill him or herself, and understands the probable consequences of his or her actions or potential actions. Suicidal intent can be determined retrospectively and in the absence of suicidal behavior. So you need to understand that in order to assess intent, you need to identify whether the person wishes to die whether they mean to kill him or herself, and whether they understand the probable consequences of their actions, which in this case is death. So again, back to the case vignette, she does have thoughts of killing herself. Let's look again at the key definition, the key term intent. Um, but she says, I would never do it. So for this vignette, the correct term is suicidal ideation without suicidal intent. Let's look at a second case example. A patient finds himself tearful and holding a knife to his wrist. He's already made a few small cuts. On his bed is a note stating, I can't go on like this, you'll be better off without me. Let's begin with these three questions. Is there any indication that the person engaged in self-directed violent behavior, either preparatory or potentially harmful? The answer is yes, so we'll proceed to question three. Did the behavior involve any injury? Yes, it did in this case. He'd made a few small cuts, so we'll again proceed to decision tree C. In decision tree C, the first thing we ask ourselves is, was the injury fatal? In this case, the answer is no. Was the behavior interrupted by self or other? In this case, uh, we know that the individual's mother found him, and so we would say, yes, it was interrupted by self or other. Is there evidence of suicidal intent? Um, because he had written the note that said, I can't go on like this, you'd be better off without me, a potential response then is yes, there is intent, and the correct term would be self suicide attempt with injury interrupted by self or other. We have had people ask us whether this is maybe perhaps more undetermined or not, and certainly I think an argument could be made for the undetermined term rather than the suicide attempt term. Here's a third example. A 75-year-old veteran loses his wife to cancer. Within hours, he purchases ammunition for a handgun he has had for years and contacts his attorney asking him to revise his will. His son asks him about these behaviors and he refuses to answer, changing the subject. Let's start again with the three questions at the top of the clinical tool. Is there any indication that the person engaged in self-directed violence, either preparatory or potentially harmful? 
If yes, proceed to question three. So he did, in fact, engage in preparatory behavior um, by purchasing the ammunition for his gun and contacting his attorney and asking to revise his will. Did the behavior cause any injury? In this case, the answer would be no. So we proceed to decision question tr uh, decision tree B. Was the behavior preparatory only? Again, let's review the key term or key concept of preparatory behavior. Preparatory behavior are acts or preparations towards engaging in self-directed violence, but before the potential in for injury has begun. This can include anything beyond a verbalization or a thought, such as assembling a method like buying a gun or collecting pills, or preparing for one's death by writing a note or giving things away. As you can see on this timeline, we've got preparatory behaviors ha happening at 4, 5, and 6 p.m., and the actual self-directed violence happening at 8 p.m. In this case, the veteran purchased the handgun at 4, I'm sorry, purchased ammunition for the handgun at 4, contacted his attorney at 6, and then was confronted by his son at 8. The purchasing the ammunition for the handgun and contacting the attorney are the preparatory behavior. So back to decision tree B. Was the behavior preparatory only? Yes. Is there evidence of suicidal intent? Again, let's review the definition for suicidal intent. That is, there's past or present evidence, either explicit or implicit, and the implicit means that clinical judgment does count in these decisions. Um, so if a clinician does believe there's enough evidence to suggest that it's present, it is in fact okay to code suicidal intent as being present. Again, so there's past or present evidence that an individual wishes to die, means to kill him or herself, and understands the probable consequences of his or her actions or potential actions. Suicidal intent can be determined retrospectively in the absence of suicidal behavior. Again, um, let's emphasize that in this case, it would be appropriate for a clinician to use their clinical judgment and decide that there was enough implicit evidence to suggest um, that this in fact is suicidal behavior, suicidal self-directed violence preparatory. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to review these materials. If you do not yet have access to the clinical tool or self-directed violence classification system, they can be found on the VISN19 Myrek webpage under the Education tab.